Hello. Today we're going to cover heat stress in camelids. I think this is a timely topic because we're getting ready to enter into the summer work season and we want to make sure that we have llamas and alpacas ready to enter into the hottest portion of the year in a safe and healthy manner for the herd. So we'd like to talk a little bit about heat stress and the background of these animals, um, some of the factors that makes them prone to developing heat stress and then we'll go through treatment and prevention of this problem. Heat stress in its simplest definition is the inability to cope with environmental conditions resulting in a detrimental rise in core body temperature. The reason this is important is because severe elevations in core body temperature can cause extreme detriment to the animal's health and well-being. We know that there are a variety of factors that contribute to heat stress in animals, and the most important of which are environmental factors, animal factors, and nutritional factors. And so we'll go through these elements of the disease individually. Environmental factors include a variety of things, notably the ambient temperature of the environment, the humidity in the environment, the degree of sun exposure or sunlight, and the topography of the farm. All of these factors are important in the animal's susceptibility to heat stress. Some of the animal factors include the gender of the animal. We do see differences between males and females in their susceptibility to heat stress. The species of the animal. We do appreciate differences between alpacas and llamas relative to their likelihood to succumb to heat stress. And we even see breed differences within the alpacas and the comparison between hakayas and surreys in the likelihood of developing heat stress. The age of the animal is important. Young animals have a much larger surface area to body mass ratio, and so they have a, lar a, a relatively greater ability to uh, develop hyperthermia when it's hot. However, young animals are also more tolerant of high temperatures. Older animals that are thin have a relatively higher surface area of their body compared to their body mass, but they have a diminished ability to deal with those high temperatures. And so older animals that are thin are relatively more susceptible to heat stress than young animals. Um, interestingly also that the uh, pregnancy status of the animal does influence its tolerance for heat stress. Pregnancy changes the physiology of the animal and the hemodynamics of the animal and can promote susceptibility to heat stress, particularly in females that are obese during the late stages of pregnancy. So it's important to be able to do body condition scoring accurately. And although we won't, dis we won't cover the specifics of body condition scoring during this seminar, it is important for you to be able to do that so that you can monitor the appropriateness of the body mass of your animals. And that will not only help you in determining which animals might be at increased risk of heat stress, but will also help you monitor your nutrition program to be sure that you're keeping up with the nutritional needs of that animal. Uh, fiber coat certainly plays an important role in heat stress. We know that heavily fleeced animals, the hakayas and some of the heavy wooled llamas are particularly prone to, prone to heat stress because those fiber coats create a very efficient thermal blanket uh, for those animals. So we're going to talk about shearing and how that impacts the animal's susceptibility to heat stress. It's important for us to recognize that the animals do have a natural thermal window which are openings in their fiber coat for them to exhaust heat. Those thermal windows are ventrally placed, so they're between the front legs, along the bottom side of the abdomen, between the rear legs, and underneath the tail head. And that's the area where heat is most efficiently given off. During the winter months, that's a very effective tool of preserving body heat because the animal can lay down, seal off those thermal windows, and preserve its body heat without losing it to the cold environment. Unfortunately, during the summer, if, the, if we maintain that fiber coat throughout the summer months, if the animals start to get heat stressed, their natural tendency is to get lethargic, and that oftentimes will cause them to lay down and stay laying down. So what happens is they have a heavy fiber coat, they lay down, and that closes their thermal window, and so now, even though they're overheating, they're not able to exchange heat, and therefore they can't cool themselves down. So it's important to keep those animals standing, uh, during the hottest parts of the day if they have a fiber coat in place for some reason. We'll also talk about parasitism and illness a little bit. We know that animals that are physiologically distressed have a diminished ability to deal 
with severe swings in temperature, extreme cold, extreme heat. Animals that are heavily parasitized or animals that, are, that have other medical problems are more likely to develop heat stress. This is particularly true and particularly severe of animals with meningeal worm. Not only are they physiologically stressed because of the meningeal worm and the effects that it has on their nervous system, they also develop a much greater tendency to heat stress because the meningeal worm incapacitates them and makes them want to lay down for extended periods of time. Now, we oftentimes think of the native environment that these animals are from, which is the Andes mountain ranges, as being an extreme environment, extreme cold and extreme heat. Um, that's actually not true for most of the areas where these animals are from. They do get exposed to quite cold temperatures, and they do get exposed to warm temperatures, but these animals are naturally residing at 8,000 to 14,000 feet elevation in much of their areas in the Andes Mountains, the but the climate is somewhat arid. It's a fairly dry climate. There are not extremes of humidity that we see in much of North America. And so the animals are able to deal with that thermal regulation in a more efficient manner because the air is not humid. It's not trapping moisture against the surface of the skin. Um, you know, the, the development of these animals in the Andean climate has uh, created or selected for an animal that's less able to deal with these extremes of heat and cold. And as an example of that, you know, we'll talk a little bit about some of the meteorological data and compare that to some of the areas of North America. There's no question these animals are well adapted to the mountainous regions of South America. They're very efficient at finding nutritive uh, forages in order to maintain themselves, and they have matched their environment um, well in terms of how often they have creas and the survival and, and thriftiness of those creas. But there's also no doubt that the extremes of temperatures are much less pronounced uh, than we see in much of North America. And here's a graph showing some of the meteorological data. So we went back and looked at um, a large cache of data from the Weather Service so that we could compare some of the North American locations, even in the northern United States where we don't expect to, to see quite uh, the swing of, of uh, cold, or not quite the swing of heat as we do in the southern United States where we don't see quite as much cold. And in this graph you'll see that there are red bars and black bars. And the red bars represent the highs and the lows of temperatures in Arequipa. And if you can look here through January all the way through the summer months and into December, that the highs and lows in Arequipa stay, and this is in Peru, stay relatively stable. The black bars are, are in Cusco, also in Peru, and if you look at the temperature swings that occur in Cusco, that during the summer months, it actually, or during their winter months, they actually will get uh, fairly cooler in Cusco, but the temperature swings are not nearly as dramatic. Now if you look at, um, and remember that the summer and winter seasons are inverted from North America from South to South America, and that's why these graphs diverge a little bit as they do, but the lime green graphs here are Columbus, Ohio, and the bright blue graphs here are Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Minnesota. And this is showing you the shifts in temperature that occur in those two middle, uh, mid portion of the U.S. and then the, in the northern part of the U.S. through the year. And you can see that there is an extreme swing from very cold temperatures to very hot temperatures. And what makes it worse is in these very hot, hot months, it's also quite humid. And so that predisposes the animal to heat stress because they aren't used to having to tolerate that type of environment. Now there are some nutritional factors that we talk about with heat stress. We know that the duration of sunlight, the intensity of sunlight, and the exposure to sunlight contribute to the development of body heat during the day. And therefore, when we talk about grazing behaviors, we oftentimes encourage people in the hot, humid climates to graze during the evenings or early mornings, particularly the early mornings, because the sun oftentimes during the summer doesn't set until nine, 8 or 9 o'clock at night, and so late evening grazing or early morning grazing are more comfortable for the animals. And so if we keep those animals in shaded, protected environments during the day and then allows them to graze at night, it's much better with reference to heat stress management. Now we do have to worry about other issues such as predators, but early morning grazing is certainly our preferred 
uh, time if we can do that. Now, stored forages certainly are a useful way of managing nutrition in camelons. But remember that stored forages are cut and dried hays. And those forages are oftentimes overly mature. They oftentimes require a much greater digestive effort than grasses do. And so stored forages actually oftentimes generate more body heat than any other nutrient source that these animals consume. And so the more hay they eat, the more likely they are to build, to contribute to body heat from their diet. And so we do try to feed storages or feed stored forages during the times of the day when we can control that heat. And so that might be at night or it might be in a shaded, well-ventilated area so that the animals uh, can exhaust that heat more efficiently. Some people have purported to feed concentrates um, during the hot summer months in order to lessen the development of nutritional source heat, body heat. To a certain degree that's true, but we have to remember that these animals are prone to acidosis. There is a concern that they might develop uh, stomach ulcers and acidosis that would be much more detrimental, detrimental to the body. And so we have to be careful with how we provide those concentrates. Basically when we talk about feeding concentrates for the management of heat stress, we're talking about daytime feeding and we're talking about feeding uh, nutrient sources that are readily and easily broken down. We should not interpret this to mean corn and oats and wheat and rye and cereal grains that contribute substantially to the starch intake of the animal. Rather we should think about concentrates as being chopped hays, alfalfa meal, beet pulp, things that are easily digested, do not require a lot of rumination, uh, but also are less likely to contribute to acid in the stomach than our cereal grains do. And so we have to be cautious about how we manage those concentrate feedings. We never want the concentrates to be more than 25% of the animal's totally, total daily dry matter intake. The most critical nutrient factor during the hot summer months is water. If the animals have access to plentiful, cool water, then they can manage a tremendous amount of heat. Um, the access to water is important because if we have water troughs that are in the open areas where the sun can heat them up during the day, uh, we have the uh, risk of exacerbating heat stress by causing uh, the ingestion of overly warm water. And we know that waters can reach high temperatures as a result of sun, sun exposure. And so water trough management is an important thing. Now recognition of heat stress. What, we're, what are we likely to see with those animals? We know that they get lethargic, so they get kind of lazy. They're wanting to lay down. They're not wanting to keep up with the herd. They don't volunteer to get up and go graze. Rather, they would, lie, they would rather lie in a cush position, oftentimes with their head and neck on the ground. Very frequently, they'll lay over on their side. And this is a very dangerous thing for them to do in heat stress, particularly if they are in sun exposure. And so if we have an animal that's acting lethargic and is not wanting to participate in grazing and participate in herd activities, we need to get them under shelter and get them into a ventilated area very quickly. You may see an increased respiratory effort. We know that as animals are trying to exhaust body heat, they increase their breathing rate and their depth of breathing. The reason they do that is because the lung is a very humid environment. And it also is very exposed to blood because it is exchanging gases with the air. And so respiration can be an efficient way of exhausting heat by taking in air and uh, using the evaporative process to exhaust or to breathe out that heat. The problem is in human environments that differential between the humidity in the, in the airways in the lung and the humidities in the natural environment is not as great and so it becomes less efficient a mechanism. And so the animals will be flaring their nostrils, sometimes they will open their mouth in an attempt to increase that surface area for breathing. And if you notice that, the animals need to get under shelter and into a ventilated area especially if you see that flaring of the nostrils in an animal that's at rest and is not stressed, that's a real warning sign for heat stress. Now in males, one of the things that we notice in males is that their scrotum gets more pendulous. The scrotum is responsible for thermoregulation of the testicles. If the testicles get too hot, the male will go sterile. So one of the first things that the body does to try to cool those testicles down is make the scrotum more pendulous so that it can exhaust heat over a larger area. 
Um, if the scrotum starts to lose its capacity to, to exchange that heat, then it will swell and become edematous or fluid filled. And this is a real warning sign. And your males on the farm can actually act as very efficient sentinel animals for you to know how your heat stress management is working on the farm. If you're doing a good job of heat stress management on the farm, then your males are going to be comfortable and their scrotal uh, dimensions will be normal. If your males have edematous swollen scrotums, then you need to reevaluate your entire herd's heat stress management program because those males are decompensating or in the process thereof. Be careful of recumbency. The animals want to lay down, they want to rest because they're overheated. That can be very dangerous if they're not shorn. It can be very dangerous if they do that in the sunlight because they will lay down and develop heat stroke and die if left unattended. Now, other things that we can do with the recognition of heat stress. You know, we, we oftentimes will see the animals congregate in areas of shade or shelter. This as is a herd activity that's telling you that they understand that it's hot outside and they're trying to seek relief from the heat. So they will tend to crowd around shelters. If there is inadequate shelter space, that can be detrimental to the animals because the more they crowd together, the less efficient ventilation is, the less efficient heat exchanges with the environment. If the sh and we're going to talk a little bit about shade in a minute because effective shade is one of the really important things you need to look at. Uh, decreased feed intake. You will notice that as the animals start to develop heat stress, they will consume less feed. And if they have decreased feed intake, you really need to take a close look at those animals and see what's going on. And then as the, as the disease process progresses, you will notice that they look apparently depressed. They respond less to stimuli. They're less aware of their surroundings. They uh, participate and interact less with their herd mates. As they develop that uh, stage of the disease, it rapidly progresses to a distress and ultimately a death. And those animals can die as a result of the heat stress. The effects of heat stress are that it changes the core body temperature. And as the core body temperature increases, this causes destabilization of cell membranes so their cell receptors and electrolytes don't function properly. That can be extremely detrimental to their vital organs, including the brain and the heart. Uh, extreme heat can cause denaturization of proteins and enzymes. The protein en and enzymes in the body are designed to operate at an optimal pH, and that pH should be around 7.2 to 7.4. As heat stress develops, and the, the animal will develop a metabolic acidosis in addition to the denaturization of these proteins and enzymes, and so they respond less efficiently, and so those cells start to malfunction, and that is very critical in the vital organs. Changes in cardiac output. You know, these animals will develop vasodilation in an, in an attempt to exchange more heat. That will oftentimes result in hypotension, and so the heart rate increases to try to maintain that circulation. And then, as the animal progresses in the disease state, uh, they start to have problems with cardiovascular function, and they will uh, develop heart failure um, as the disease progresses into its later uh, stages. The changes in cardiac output and the changes in cardiopulmonary physiology result in decreased vital organ perfusion. So at the same time that the heat is interfering with cell membrane function and interfering with protein and enzyme function and interfering with cardiac output, the vital organs such as the brain and the heart and the liver and the kidney are getting less blood. And so that's extremely dangerous for the animal. And then as that happens, the capillary permeability of the vessels increases and so they start to develop edema. They'll develop pulmonary edema and so they have more difficulty breathing which creates more difficulty in getting rid of heat and then they will develop cerebral edema or brain swelling and that oftentimes ends up in the death of the animal. That increased capillary permeability and the edema that results from that fluid extravasation from the blood vessels will cause uh, decreased blood, decreased protein or extravasation of protein from the blood, um, which exacerbates the fluid dynamics because it's with less protein in the blood, there's a lower oncotic pressure, it's easier for that fluid to move outside of those vessels. We also see massive electrolyte losses. Some of the electrolyte losses are from decreased intake of food and water. Some of them are from increased secretion of sweat glands, and so the electrolytes are lost in that way. 
Some of those are from salivary losses and urinary losses. Some of those electrolyte losses are from, from disturbances of metabolism in the body as it's trying to compensate for the heat stress. So pulmonary edema, fluid distension in the lung. Brain edema, fluid distension in the brain. Testicular and scrotal edema, fluid distension in the scrotum and testicles. That uh, can cause any, anything from a temporary sterility to a permanent sterility or death, depending on the stage of the disease. So we need to intervene early. Early immediate action is required. We don't want to look at a male and notice that his scrotum is a little bit swelled, swell, swollen in the morning and go to work thinking that we're going to check on him at the end of the day when we get home because when we get home that animal might be dead. And so we need to early quick intervention because we can almost always save animals from heat stress if we get to them quickly enough. So treat it as an emergency situation. If you see signs of heat stress, get their rectal temperature. Get them under cover, get them into a protected environment, find out what their body temperature is, and then make an assessment of the rest of the herd to see if there are multiple animals at risk. The quick, easy rule of thumb that we oftentimes use is a heat stress index. And the heat stress index is a little bit different than we see reported on the news for people. The heat stress index that we use is a very simple calculation, which is the temperature of the environment plus the humidity in the environment, and that gives us a number. And so when the heat stress index is less than 120, we consider those animals to be a low risk of heat stress. And so less than 120 would be similar to a day that's 80 degrees and 20% humidity, the heat stress index would be 100. Or 90 degrees today, but a heat, but a uh, humidity index of 30 would give us 120. And so, you know, we can use that as a guide. We know that if it's 80 degrees and 80% humidity, the heat stress, stress index is going to be 160, and that's a dangerous situation. What's more important, though, than, than any individual day's heat stress index is the cumulative heat stress index. And that is the number of days in a row that the heat stress index is high. There's no question whatsoever that we see a big spike in heat stress cases when there have been multiple days where the ambient temperature does not drop down very much at night. If the nighttime temperatures stay between 70 and 80, we know that the next day that animal is going to have much more difficulty dealing with the heat. When the nighttime temperature drops below 70 degrees Fahrenheit, that animal has a chance to recover, and they can recover their ability, their fluid dynamics, their electrolytes, their organ perfusion, their cardiac output, their, their homeostasis, so that they can then go into the next day refreshed and ready to deal with the heat. When we have those hot, humid nights, the animal never has a chance to recover, and they start to suffer the consequences on a cumulative basis, and too many of those days strung together can be disastrous for the animal. And so we really need to pay attention to that. Now, if you want to get an idea for how your herd's doing, and you can, you can take the rectal temperature and see what the animals in the herd are ranging as. But you need to remember that it's normal for rectal temperature to be higher during the summer. And so if the rectal temperature is up to 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit, we don't worry too much. Even if it's up to 103, it's not that uncommon. If it's over 103, we get concerned. If it's 105 or higher, we get critically concerned about the health of that animal. We expect that during the summer, up to 30% of a herd will have rectal temperatures above 102, as opposed to the winter where we expect fewer than 10% of the herd to have temperatures over 102. And so that's a natural process. The ambient temperatures are higher, the humidity is higher, and so their resting body temperature is higher. And so it's worthwhile for you to randomly check the body temperatures of a number of animals. And shearing time is an ideal time to do that so that you have an understanding of what your normal values are for your animals, where are they normally sitting. And if you monitor that periodically during the summer, you'll get a good idea of how you're doing with heat stress management. If more than 30% of your herd has an average rectal temperature of over 102, you need to reevaluate how you're doing heat stress management. Treatment. Early treatment cannot be overstressed. Early treatment is very successful, and it's very simple. The simple early treatment for heat stress is shade, shearing, ventilation, and water, cool, fresh water. Um, and so we're going to talk a, a little bit more in, deep, in depth about those factors in just a minute. 
if you have an animal that you suspect is starting to suffer the effects of heat stress, the first thing you do is get them to a shaded, well-ventilated area. The second thing you do is get them shorn. If they haven't been shorn, get them shorn. If it's a llama and you've only done a barrel cut, you need to finish shearing them. Finish, shear their front quarters and their neck and shear their hind quarters because if that animal is starting to suffer heat stress, then the barrel cut is not sufficient to manage that animal. And then the third thing is cooling them off. And so here in the, vi in the uh, view on the right, we have an alpaca that has started to suffer heat stress. We brought it into a barn. It's on concrete flooring. We've wetted the concrete down so that it's cool. We've shorn that animal. And then we've wetted the underbelly of that animal down to try to cool it down. And we're going to allow that animal to rest in that shaded, well-ventilated area. We've got some fans on it, and he's going to recover very quickly. There are supplemental therapies that we can do. One of them is physical therapy. If we have an animal with heat stress and they're not shorn, we need to protect them from laying down unless they're in a very cool area such as a water bath. Until you can get them shorn, they need to optimize that thermal window, that window on their ventral abdomen, between their front legs, between their hind legs, and under their tail head. It's really important that they be able to exchange heat. We can do some medical therapy as well by adding antioxidants into the diet. Vitamin E is one of the most common things that we add, and we give animals between 1 and 2,000 units of vitamin E every day when we're worried about heat stress. It's a very uh, helpful antioxidant to try to protect the cells in the body. The other thing we try to do is make sure that the animals have access to trace minerals and salt. We know that electrolytes can get imbalanced during the summer months, and so by giving that animal access to trace minerals and salt, we're allowing them to replace some of those deficits that they have and they can help recover themselves. The other thing that we do supplementally is restrict the activity of the animal. We want them to graze at night. We want them to stay in a shaded, well-ventilated area during the day so that they can recover from that heat stress episode. Now, in those animals that get very severe, veterinary attention is required. And veterinary attention, veterinary attention can mean a variety of things. Sometimes that is simply or administering oral electrolytes so that the animals can get fluid and electrolyte replacements. Sometimes we do intravenous electrolytes, but we have to be extremely careful with intravenous electrolytes. We talked about how heat stress changes capillary permeability, and you can accelerate the death of a heat stress animal with intravenous fluids if they're not given extremely cautiously. Because as you're putting electrolytes in water more, electrolytes and water into the bloodstream, that can then leak out of the vessels and actually cause uh, testicular edema, pulmonary edema, and cerebral edema to get worse. And so we have to be careful with the administration of IV fluids. We do occasionally give non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Flenixin megalamine, the most common product is banamine, is one of the most, most commonly used drugs that we use. And we use these non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to try to ameliorate the effects of the heat stress on endothelial cells and the effects of the metabolic acidosis on those vital organs. We sometimes will inject them with vitamin E and selenium and those can be very useful uh, minerals and vitamins to help protect the body but they have to be given carefully so that we don't end up with a toxicity because, because selenium toxicity can be fatal to the animal as well. Uh, keeping ready access to trace minerals and salt to clear fresh water, and then doing the types of physical therapy uh, that we've already discussed. Now hydrotherapy is one of the more common practices that people have done to try to lessen the core body temperature of that animal. And so we got curious about that. How effective is that therapy and, and what types of things should we be doing when we're doing that therapy? And so we've done a little bit of research with hydrotherapy and, and I want to talk you through some of the things that we learned. We know that if the animal remains in the full sunlight, hydrotherapy is not effective at all. And this graph is showing you three different populations. One, animals that uh, were not administered any water. These are shorn, al shorn alpacas. Uh, one group, which is the dark bar, where they were not given any hydrotherapy at all. The pink bar, where they were given hydrotherapy along their belly only. Many people have talked about only putting it on their ventral abdomen. And then the yellow bars where they were, uh, their entire body was soaked down with water. 
uh, we know that if those animals stay in the full sun, that this is not an effective way of cooling them down and, in fact, can make the situation worse. And so we do see a subtle decrease in body temperature there about 30 minutes, but then you can see that the core body temperature steadily increases um, at a dangerous rate. And so getting them out of the sun is the most important thing that we do. Now, if we take uh, those animals out of the sun and put them in a shaded area, then we see a very beneficial effect of hydrotherapy. And so here again, the dark line are the animals that are brought into the shade at time zero. The pink bar is the animals that got hydrotherapy on their belly. And then the yellow bars are the ones that got their entire body soaked down. And you can see that putting uh, water on their belly or on their entire body um, are very similar. Putting it on their entire body did drop their core body temperature more significantly. Um, but remember, these animals are in the shade. And you can see that that core, core body temperature dropped uh, by 15 minutes, and then it stayed significantly below the animals that did not have hydrotherapy all the way out almost to an hour and a half. That's a pretty significant benefit to the hydrotherapy. But as you can see, out at about 120 minutes, you know, you have this rebound temperature that occurs, and so you've got to be doing other things simply than simply giving them water. And you can see that there's actually a tendency there for the animals that got wetted down completely for that body temperature to continue to rise. And so you, hydrotherapy can be beneficial in the short term, but it should not be relied upon to treat heat stress in the long term. Now, shade. Let's talk about that a little bit because a lot of people think of shade simply as a shadow. And shade is not a shadow. Shade needs to be effective. And so it, ne it needs to be shelter from the heat. Um, if you think about how Mother Nature provides shade, you need to think of a tree. And you need to t think of a tall, majestic tree. And you think of how good it feels like if you take a chair and go and sit under a shade tree. And it's cool, it's refreshing, and it's out of the sunlight. How do trees do that? They're very tall. They have open leaves so that the, so that the heat and wind can flow through the tree without being trapped underneath of it. It shouldn't be hotter under a tree than it is out in a shaded area where there's no cover. It should be comfortable. That's what we mean by effective shade. Shade that allows for a shadow and ventilation and no trapping of heat. And so trees are absolutely the best thing. And we try to emulate trees when we build buildings for heat stress management. If you think about those trees, they're tall, they're large, they have a long uh, limb span away from their trunk and they have a lot of leaves and so that allows free movement of the breeze, doesn't trap the heat, and it casts a large shadow regardless of the position of the tree in the sun. That's the best type of shade that we could have. And so this is a tree that's during the winter months and so it doesn't have any leaves on it. But you can appreciate that those trunks go straight up but the, lee, or but the limbs uh, project out for great distances away from that trunk. You know this tree has an effective shade area of over a thousand square feet. Those trunks are going out about 20 to 30 feet away from that tree in some instances. And so when that tree is fully fleshed with leaves, there's a very large shade footprint that's caused and it's a very comfortable tree to sit in during the summer months. Now take these pine trees as an example. There's a lot of different conifers that you could have around uh, camellids. The ones on the left here, where the limbs go all the way down to the ground, although that pine tree is, sh is throwing an effective shadow, <coughs> it is not providing effective shade because the limbs are trapping the heat down around the ground and they're limiting the amount of air that can move through them. As opposed to the pine trees that are on the right where their uh, bottom of their trunks are very bare, uh, their limbs are high, they're, they are not only showing, throwing a shadow but they're also providing effective shade. So there's e easy movement of air through that area so that animals can sit underneath those trees and be very comfortable. And so when we build shelters, we like to emulate trees. We want tall roofs and open sidewalls so that the air can move through them very effectively. <coughs> and we'll talk about different types of shelters. But the desirable thing of a shelter is to have dimensions that are useful for the creation of shade. And we're talking about effective shade. They need to be deep, they need to be wide, they need to be long, they need to be tall, they need to have a vented roof, and they need to have the free movement of air. That's an ideal shelter for heat stress management. 
There are a lot of shelters that are available out there. Three-sided shelters, large open-sided shelters, tunnel barns, Quonset huts, pole barns. There are lots of different models. The three-sided shelter, open-fronted three-sided shelter, is one of the more common uh, designs that people use. We use them here at the university. These shelters are very effective for winter housing. It allows us to put bedding inside of those. The solid walls prevent the wind from flowing through the shelter. But during the summer months, these are essentially pasture ovens. They trap heat. And you will oftentimes see camelids laying around the outside of the shelter, trying to stay where the air movement is free, rather than lying into the inside of the shelter. And that's unfortunate. And so we have done some research with various types of shelters, three-sided shelters, um, canopy tents, such as is pictured here in between these two shelters, uh, to try to get an idea of what um, shelters are most beneficial with the management of heat stress. And what we did in this study is we compared three-sided shelters to carport shades to, large, uh, to a large open-sided barn. This was a pole barn that was partially enclosed. Um, and then also to tunnel ventilation barns. And tunnel ven ventilation barns are basically long barns where the air can move readily and freely through the barn. And so these types of shelters, these what I call pasture ovens during the summer, are very effective for winter protection, but m offer very little effective uh, relief during the summer. And so let's look at some of the results of that study. When we were looking at the temperature, we looked at the temperature um, within the shelter and also outside the shelter. And on the particular day that, that we're giving an example of here, the temperature was about 85 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity was about 60%. So an average day during the summer months for us. Uh, the inside of the shelter was 115 degrees. Outside the shelter was about 90 degrees. It was actually hotter on the margins around the outside of the three-sided shelter and inside the three-sided shelter than it was the ambient temperature, pasture ovens. And so the animals that were going into the shade areas seeking relief were not getting relief, they were actually getting overheated. The carport did a better job, and so the average temperature under the carport was 85 degrees, similar to the ambient temperature, but the shade did provide protection from the sunlight. The open-sided barn similarly did a good job. It did not trap heat, and so it was not hotter in the barn, but it did provide shade and allow free movement of air. The tunnel ventilation barn was the most effective, and the tunnel ventilation barn in this particular day dropped the ambient temperature about 5 degrees because it allowed that deep wind movement to cool the uh, temperature within the barn. We oftentimes see ambient temperatures in tunnel ventilation barns 5 to 10 or even 15 degrees cooler than the ambient temperatures as a result of that efficient wind movement. And so we like to get away from these type of low shelters. If we're using three-sided shelters, we like to see them with taller roofs and we like to see them with vented walls so that you can open up those walls, particularly the bottom side. If you leave the, the solid siding at the top, that will increase the, the shade footprint of the building, but you open up the the bottom sides of those solid walls and that will allow free air movement on the undersides of the animals uh, where they can uh, seek shelter from the sun. This is an example of a concrete area. This is an area that can be wetted down and cooled off a little bit. Um, it does provide a very open area for free flow of, mo of wind and air and has a pretty decent uh, footprint for shade. Although as you can see here, when we open that facility up a lot, we end up with sun coming into the areas where we would rather have shade. This is possibly the most ideal setting, which is an extremely large pole barn. So the roof in this barn is about 40 to 50 feet, um, about 30 to 40 feet tall. It has a vented roof. It has completely open sidewalls. And so this at, provides the maximum amount of flow through air, an extremely large shade footprint, and does the best job of emulating that tree that we would like to see. This is a, a, a tunnel ventilation barn. It's closed up at this time. The picture was taken because it's during the cool part of the year. It's during the winter months. But when we open the doors to this barn, because of its orientation and because of the side windows, we're going to get a, a pretty consistent air movement through that barn, uh, through the length of the barn. And we can use fans 
to accentuate that air movement so it'll cool that barn down. So it's a very tall roof. It's a vented roof. Um, it has vents all the way along the sides to allow air movement in. And then it has the large intake and outflow doors to allow that wind to move through and cool the environment down. Now, shearing. You know, we shear during the spring because we want to harvest the fiber from the animals so that we can make textiles products off of it. But shearing is a critical part of heat stress management. Even if you're not using the hair to create textiles products, you still need to shear it from the animal in order to manage their uh, body temperature during the summer months. And so the fiber coat creates that thermal insulation effect. The fiber does not really protect the skin from sunlight. Some people say, we want to leave the fiber on to protect them from sunburn. That's probably true to a certain extent, but not to the fiber coat. The fiber coat is going to trap heat. And so the benefit of protection is overwhelmed. And we talked about that thermal window, the armpits, the groin, the tail head. We're going to, by shearing them, we're going to open up those thermal windows, make them much larger, give the animal a much better ability to deal with the heat. Now we do look at barrel cuts versus full body cuts, and we have done some research with this, looking at um, how effectively the body temperature of the animal is affected by shearing them. And there is no question whatsoever that a full body cut, where the barrel and the legs and the neck are all sheared, is much more effective at controlling core body temperature than a barrel cut. Barrel cut is better than no cut, but we have seen llamas come in with heat stress despite the fact that they had shade uh, with only a barrel cut in place. And so the first thing we do with those llamas is shear the rest of the body and get them opened up. Shearing should be done before the onset of heat stress conditions. And so we recommend shearing uh, toward the end of the spring, mid, mid portion to the end of the spring. And so in most areas of the United States, that means April and May, and so our target is to have all animals shorn by June 1st. Certainly the animals need to be shorn by the middle of June in almost every area of the U.S. Um, if you wait until after the animals are developing heat stress to shear them, it can take them the entire rest of the summer to recover from the heat stress episode. And we have seen, particularly in males, that they can take three to six months to fully recover from all of the untoward effects of heat stress. So sharing them before the onset of heat stress conditions is vital. If the clinical signs of heat stress are noted, shearing should be done immediately. It should not be postponed, whatever it takes to get the hair off that animal. In healthy llamas and alpacas, heat stress is seen almost exclusively in animals that have not been sufficiently shorn. Most often that's animals that have not been shorn at all. Sometimes that's animals that have only had a barrel cut where their thorax and abdomen have been shorn. And so when we look at um, alpacas, for example, that were shorn versus those that were not shorn. Animals that um, had a full body shear, had a core body temperature that was almost a full degree below the animals that had a full hair coat. And when those animals were exercised to a minimum level, the animals that had a full hair coat increased their body temperature a full degree or more very quickly. And so animals that are not shorn are more prone to heat stress without question. Now let's talk a little bit about ventilation. You know, ventilation is a complicated thing. It's air movement, um, it's facilitation of heat exchange. You know, heat is exhausted most efficiently in alpacas and llamas by radiant and evaporative heat loss from the skin surface. These animals don't sweat well. You know, they have some sweat glands, but they're not very plentiful, and so they don't le lose heat very well by sweating. They also don't lose heat very well by breathing efficiency. And we talked a little bit about that and how the animals will change their breathing pattern to try to deal with heat stress. But they not, they're not very good at it. They're not very efficient at it. The best thing we can do is get that um, hair off so that they can have a larger surface area to exchange heat with the environment through ventilation. The movement of air, coil, air cools the surface of the skin by increasing evaporative heat loss. This is critical when humidity is high. If the humidity is high and the air movement is low, then there's a, a barrier that forms around that animal that insulates the animal to a certain degree. And so ev evaporative heat loss is diminished and respiratory heat loss is diminished when humidity is high. And so we need to be really careful about that. Now, 
when I walk into a lot of facilities barns, I find that their that their fans are in competition with each other, as this diagram on the upper right shows. We don't want to see that. This is X'd out. These fans are are all facing toward the interior of the barn in an attempt to try to allow as many animals to sit in front of the fan as possible. The problem is, is that is creating a swirling type motion in that hair and so, or in the air and so this air is just kind of swirling around the barn and so it's actually facilitating the trapping of heat in that barn. What we want is more like this lower building and that is a tunnel ventilation effect. We want those fans to be complementary to each other. We want them to all be contributing to air movement so that we're getting that air out of the barn and we're exchanging that air. That helps keep it the humidity down. It, it helps lower the temperature and makes it much more comfortable in the barn. Tunnel ventilation barns are comfortable and relaxing to walk into because they're cooler. Barns that are that are square with competing fans are uncomfortable to walk into because they're not really cooler and the air is just swirling around, it's, it's just not as comfortable. And so we want complementary fans when we're constructing them in the barn. Um, ventilation for the animal, for floor level fans are good, and we do want a high flow rate on those fans, but we want to encourage the animals to stand so that they increase their thermal window, so we have more surface area for ventilation and we don't want those fans competing with each other. We want those fans to be in a complementary direction. Water. One of the most critical components to preventing heat stress is water. We must encourage water intake. It needs to be cool, it needs to be fresh, and it needs to be plentiful. Waters during the summer months should be shaded. And so an exposed water like this, um, if that was an open well waterer um, in this picture, the, the sun would heat that water up considerably during the day. This is a closed water. This is a covered water. This is a ball valve right here. Um, and that actually keeps the water that's within this reservoir protected from the sun so it's less likely to heat up. Ideally, we'd like that water reservoir to be inside the sheltered barn so that it can be a cool, refreshing drink for those animals instead of a warm drink because we know that sunlight very easily heats water up to temperatures in excess of 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day during the summer months. And so unsheltered water can be problematic because it'll heat up during the day which decreases the water intake which exacerbates all of those negative physiological things that are happening to the animal such as decreasing blood volume, decreasing cardiac output and that compromises the ability of the animal to lose heat. And so water is the vital resource. And so the best thing we can do is prevent heat stress. We don't want to be uh, intervening on an emergency basis on anybody's farm. We want everybody to prevent heat stress, and that means shear the animal. That means it, providing them effective shade, shelter, and ventilation, and that means good water management. Preventing heat stress is the easiest tool. An ounce of prevention is, a pound, is worth a pound of cure, and that is never more true than it is with heat stress. Um, you know, we should talk a little bit more about nutrition and the prevention of heat stress. Can we feed to prevent heat stress? Yes and no. Um, you cannot use nutrition to uh, counter effect the sun, the humidity, and the water. You've got to have good ventilation, you've got to have good shade, you've got to have good water sources. But you can alter your grazing patterns to match the cooler parts of the day so the animals are in a comfortable facility during the day. Um, and feed more of your concentrates during the day and you can graze them in the evenings, you can feed hay to them in the evenings. I would rather have an animal graze in the morning and eat hay at night than just about any other pattern because that allows that animal to get out during the cooler parts of the day and get that fresh green grass and then at night when the sun is down and the temperatures are falling they can be digesting that hay and balancing out that diet. Um, the ideal situation, I suppose, would be an open grass pasture with lots of shade trees dispersed intermittently around that pasture. The rumination process, this is important to remember, produces heat. The way they digest food produces heat. And there's no question that more heat is produced with hay than it is anything else that we feed them, and less heat is produced with grain. And that's counterintuitive for a lot of people because they feed grain during the winter, to try to give them more energy for heat. 
Um, the only thing that grain does during the winter is provide more energy for the muscles, and so they might be more active, they might be able to shiver more, but there's very little heat produced from the digestion of grain, and it's much more heat produced from the digestion of hay because it takes longer to digest it. Grass is an excellent source because not only is it relatively easy to digest, but it has a lot of water in it. And so when they're eating grass, they're eating water as well. And so in conclusion, the best thing you can do for heat stress is don't let it happen to you. Be prepared for the summer. Get your facilities ready for heat. And so be thinking about that. Be thinking about shade. Be thinking about water. Be thinking about nutrition. And get your animals signed up to be shorn. And I know that you're going to have a great summer, and your animals will too. And so I wish you the best of luck, and thank you for your attention today.